personal injury court. Good day, everyone. This is the matter of McGuire versus Brooks. It's my understanding, Ms. McGuire, that you are suing for injuries you received when a nail gun shot a nail through your head. Yes. You're suing Mr. Brooks for those injuries, and you have $300,000 in medical expenses, $200,000 for future medical expenses, and $1.5 million for pain and suffering. You want this court to award you $2 million against Mr. Brooks. Is that correct? Yes, Your Honor. Mr. Brooks, it's your position today that had Ms. McGuire waited for you and not been in the wrong place at the wrong time, this would have never happened, and thus this is not your fault. True? Yes, Your Honor. Now, let's get into the legal sauce. Now, Ms. McGuire, tell me, uh, how did you come to even hire Mr. Brooks? Yes, Your Honor. So, I am a musician. I okay. play the bass guitar and the ukulele for my indie rock band. I fool with a sax every once in a while. Hey, maybe you could join our band one day. <laughs> uh, so, I was headed on a three-month tour around the country visiting different bars. We had some sold-out um, areas, sold-out concerts, and I hired Mr. Brooks to build a recording studio in my home on the second floor. After the three months uh, had passed, I was really excited to see the work that Mr. Brooks had done on our recording Did you studio. think it was going to be done in three months? Uh, I was told that it was going to be near done when I got back. And Mr. Brooks, tell me about your company. How long have you been doing construction? Well, Your Honor, I've been in business for about 25 years. Long and time. Basically, yes. Yes, Your Honor. And basically for the last five of those years, I ran my own business, a bag of bricks remodeling as a remodeling contractor. How, how long does something like this normally take? Well, it depends on the extravagancy of uh, the project. Uh, she wanted a state-of-the-art studio put in. So okay, she was going to do it right. Yeah, she was going to do it up. She was going to do it up. So. And so how long was it supposed to take in your estimation? Well, in my estimation, we should have been done about three, three and a half months, four months tops. So, Ms. McGuire, take me to the day that uh, this happened. What happened? Yes, Your Honor. So I arrived home. Um, I walked up the stairs in my house uh, and walked through a plastic drape. I immediately stubbed my toe. Natural reaction, you know, you, you bend down to make sure that everything's okay. And, and where are you in, in your house? I'm on you? the second floor of my home. Okay, at the entrance of the studio? At the entrance of the studio, yes, and Your Honor. So then what happened? So then I stood back up, I turned my head, and I immediately bumped into something. I didn't know what it was, but immediately it, it was just this excruciating pain in the right side of my head. It, it felt like a bomb had exploded inside my head. I thought I was having a stroke. I wasn't sure what was going on. Somehow I was able to pull my phone out of my pocket and dial 911. Um, and, and the next thing that I remember I woke up in the hospital and that's when the doctor told me that there was a three inch nail that had pierced my skull. So this is the actual nail that pierced my skull. It went in uh, right here in my temple behind my eye and then it pierced up through my optic nerve and into my brain. And, and your you honor, must have I am been scared out of your wit. I was scared to death and, and now I am completely blind in my right eye. Sheriff Matt, could you get the nail? Let me see it. So this nail went into your eye? Yes, this, Your Honor. This was sticking in your head? That was what the surgeon pulled out of my skull. That's your head, Ms. McGuire? Yes, Your Honor. Uh, Mr. Brooks, what do you call this kind of nail? Well, it's a galvanized nail. Okay, it's an industrial nail, isn't it? Yes, sir. So you had an industrial nail sticking in your head while you're trying to make a call? Yes, Your Honor. I believe it was shock. So I was able to call 911, um, and I, I actually you... did bring a recording of that tape, Your Honor. Well, let's hear that. You've submitted it to the court. Let's hear the 911 call. 911, what's your emergency? I, I, I have a terrible pain. Please send help. It's in my head. It hurts so bad. Please help. I can't move. Hello? Ma'am, I'm still here. What's your address? Ma'am, you said you have something in your head. Hello? Hello? So, so when this cuts off, what happens? Uh, I blacked out. Apparently, there was blood everywhere. Miss McGuire, is that your blood? Yes, Your Honor. So, Mr. Brooks, tell me how you knew something bad had gone on. Well, Your Honor, basically, I pulled up and saw Miss McGuire going into her home, and uh, I yelled out to her, and she continued to go into the entrance of her home. And so she looked like she was in a bit of a hurry. I, I imagine that maybe she had to use the bathroom or something like that. So okay. I pulled in, gathered my notes, grabbed my fold, and I went in to uh, meet her upstairs uh, to the uh, top of the entrance. And when I got up there and went through the plastic draping, that's what did when... you see? That's when I saw. 
That's when I saw Mrs. McGuire laying in a pool of blood. And, so she's and lying on the floor. She's laying there. She's got a nail in her head. She's I, passed out and her blood's all over the floor? Well, Yana, I don't know what's in her head. I just see her laying in a pool of blood. And it, it just shocked me because she just came in. This had four, to freak five you ago. out, too. Yes, this sir. I was shocked. I didn't. I mean, so I grabbed my phone and I called 911. Did you know what had happened at that point? I had no idea what had happened. I'm trying to figure out. She just walked in the house. But you called 911. I called 911, sir. Now, Mr. Brooks, you you see, this is pretty bad stuff. This is a bad injury, right? Oh yes, sir. I empathize with her. And it, and it uh, was your nail gun. Uh, yes, sir. It was my your gun. nail. Uh, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Her injury. Uh, absolutely, Your but, Honor. But you absolutely. tell me today it's not your fault. Tell me why. Well, Your Honor, we had an agreement to meet at her garage. You did? At 1.30. Okay. At 1.30, and that way I can safely navigate her into the home. Okay. Now, she never mentioned a time. How are you so sure? I have text messages here, Your Honor. Okay. I have text messages that we Sheriff Matt, if you'll get the text agreement. So you all had an agreement to, to meet at 1.30. Yeah, and she and actually showed up early. I'm looking at what you've submitted to this court, this text message that says, and I guess you're in the blue, it says, hey, things are coming along, when are you coming home, question mark. Yes, sir. And then in the gray, Miss McGuire, it says, my flight lands tomorrow at noon. I take it that's you. You remember this, right? Yes, Your Honor. Then in the blue, you, Mr. Brooks, you say, perfect, meet me in front of the garage at 1.30. 1.30. And then, Miss McGuire, you say, great, See you there. You understood y'all were going to meet at 1.30. Yes, Your Honor, and that right? is where the text yes. message and so, ended. So now, if, had she followed your instructions, take me through how this was going to happen. We're going to go over the notes. I'm going to show her that we've made the changes that she wanted to make, and then we were going to go into the construction area, safely into, so I can navigate her through. I know the hazards, I know the dangers, I know the phase that we had at that time. If she would have only waited. I see that you have submitted this uh, text message. You know, in courts, often it is uh, one word against another word. Yes. It's always important to have documents. Yes, sir. You remember you were supposed to be there at 1.30, right? Yes, Your Honor. You came a little early? I arrived maybe five minutes early. And had you met him there at 1.30, he could have guided you through the house. I didn't know that I needed to be guided through the house. That's the point it's that I'm trying to make. He says, zone. let me get through what I'm talking about, Mr. Brooks. He told me to meet him there at 1.30. I get there. He's not at the garage. I expect maybe he has already gone inside. This is not 1.30. Well, 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 there was no car there, right? For him. His car wasn't there. I don't know what kind of car he drove. So you don't take any responsibility for your injuries? I do not take any responsibility for my injuries, okay. no, Your Honor. I know you've been through a lot. I know you've been through a lot, but you do understand that had you come at 1.30, at least he would have been able to guide you through. But I was not made aware of any of the dangers of a construction area. Now, you are asking this court to award you $300,000 for past medical bills, right? Yes, Your Honor. And you're also looking at $200,000 for future meds. What kind of uh, future meds did you have in your idea of what's gonna happen? I need therapy. Uh, I need for this to completely heal, which I'm still going to have to go to multiple doctor's checkups. Still got a long road ahead of you. I've got a very long road ahead of me. Now, Your you're, Honor. you're also asking this court for $1.5 million for pain and suffering. Yes, Your Honor. There, there are a couple of different kinds of pain in every personal injury case. There's the pain you feel, your body, your head, your eye, and then what's on your mind and your heart. Uh, this is devastating. I, like I was saying, this has been my dream since I was seven years old. I'm having to cancel shows. I don't get the money for canceling the shows. This is my livelihood, and it is being completely taken away from me. I will never be able to see out of my right eye again. That's what your doctors are telling you. That is what my doctors will, have said. Will you have to wear a patch? I mean, your, your eyeball is still there, right? My eyeball is still there. I will have to wear a patch for a good amount of time. It's not a pretty sight, I'm gonna be honest. There is a nasty scar there. Now, it's an understatement to say nail in the head. When this nail went into your head... It went through my skull and into the fluid that is surrounding your brain. So it was sticking in the compartment where your brain is. Yes, it fractured my skull when it went into my head, Your Honor. So you, you do see, uh, Mr. Brooks, she's been through a lot and still got a lot to go. Regardless of whose fault it is. Absolutely. Do, do you feel badly for this? I feel terrible. I, I hate this incident even happened. So this must have broken you up, too. 25 years, I've never had anything to the extent happen. Never. 
and really, Your Honor, to, to really be honest, she really wasn't properly dressed to go onto an active construction site. Well, I know I wear a robe to come in court. Is there something you're supposed to wear? And you're properly dressed, Your Construction Honor. site? You're properly dressed. What's she proper dress? Not, well, when she came into the... And we have pictures. I, I did bring a few pictures. Okay. Story. Okay, now, basically... Tell me what Your we're Honor. looking at here on the plasma. Your Honor, look here. But this is just coming up. This is just coming in. Look at all of the debris here. Look at all... There's things that... There's hazards that you can trip. She comes on the job site with flip-flops on. This is not a toe injury, it's a head injury. I understand it's the head injury. Okay. But if you're coming into a construction site, there's all kind of things around. There's wood, there's nails sticking up out of wood. You gotta there's be prepared. All, you have to be prepared. You need a hard hat on. Well, how would she get a hard hat? Because before you actually get up to the stairs here, yes, there's sir. a bin at the entrance of the door when you come in that has all kind of personal protective equipment in it. Okay. Hard hats, glasses, gloves, anything you need to come in. And again, we would have been able to put those things on. You can return to the podium, sir. Thank you. Honey. Thank you so much. I appreciate you. Uh, Ms. McGuire, did you see this big bin of hard hats and glasses? No, I did not. I was looking for the defendant, Your Honor. We keep talking about this yellow elephant in the room called the nail gun. Is that the nail gun that shot that nail in your head? Yes, This Your Honor. This is the nail gun, uh, Your Honor. It's a nail gun. Yeah, you can put it down there. I don't want you to shoot my sheriff here. Oh, no, no, Yanni. What's that do that, uh, that helps you at a construction site? Well, basically, it, it, it's, it's a rapid fire uh, a nail gun. That way you're not hammering. Hammering is old school. So basically, it's compressed with air, and you can press it down okay. and shoot it off. It will not shoot off if it's not pressed down. Okay. I wanted to learn more about how this gun functioned, how you handle it. So this court uh, hired an independent general contractor who knows a little something about construction sites. His name is Jeff Lupton. Sheriff, could you get Mr. Lupton in here? Yes, Your Honor. Mr. Lupton, come on in. Thank you, Your Honor. For the record, state your name, please. Uh, my name is Jeff Lupton. Mr. Lupton, what do you do as a general contractor? Uh, I do residential and commercial uh, additions, renovations, uh, build outs. How long have you been in construction? I've been in business for 22 years. Mr. Lupton, how dangerous are nail guns? You see this nail gun on the uh, podium there? Yes, how sir. dangerous are they? Uh, they're extremely dangerous. Why? Uh, Basically, uh, the way a nail gun uh, works is with a, a compressor, electric compressor, that compresses air to uh, 120 PSI through that hose connected to the nail gun itself and through bursts of high pressure air, basically shoots, uh, shoots the nails out at a really, really high velocity. I understand you brought a couple of videos. Yes, sir, I did. Can, can you walk me through those? Absolutely. Kind of give you an example of, uh, of kind of how a, a nail gun would be used actively on a site where you're, where you're putting two pieces of wood together and some framing. And again, you can see that the nail just goes through there easily, and that's two uh, three-quarter inch pieces of, uh, of pine. If it shoots a nail through wood that easily, it must go through a human head like peanut butter. I would imagine so. It's pretty intense. Now, Mr. Lupton, Mr. Brooks testified that if the plaintiff had been wearing a hard hat, that hard hat would have protected her from this nail gun. Well, uh, while using safety equipment is always important on a construction site, a safety hat wouldn't necessarily have, have protected her directly from it. And we, sh we have an example here of a three-inch nail uh, going right through. It goes through the hard hat. hard hat. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Miss Brooks, you saw that video, right? Yes, Your Honor. Uh, seems like that hard hat wouldn't have stopped us from getting here today. True? <laughs> Uh, yes, Your Honor, if... I think you did a good thing as a business owner to provide those hard hats. Absolutely. But they're kind of for bricks and things falling, right? Absolutely. Folks, I think I've heard enough. I'm ready to render my decision. <laughs> Every personal injury case, the plaintiff must prove that the defendant's wrong caused your injury. Here today, Ms. McGuire, you have shown that you could not have anticipated that a nail gun was loaded and ready to change your life waiting inside. This has affected your life, affected your life as a musician, and hurt you emotionally. It's a permanent injury, and that's why you're seeking a huge award from this court. Mr. Brooks, you tried to do what was responsible. You told her what time to be there. You told her to wait for you at the garage so you could walk through and escort her past the danger. But this happened, and this is why we are here today. Ms. McGuire, I find that you have proven that Mr. Brooks was wrong and that his wrong caused your injury. However, the evidence shows that he wasn't wrong by himself. You were wrong also. You were responsible for your injuries partly. Here, 
You are asking this court to award you $300,000 for past medical bills, $200,000 for future medical bills, and $1.5 million for pain and suffering for a total award of $2 million that you seek. Because I find you 49% responsible for your injuries, I'm only going to award 51% of what you are requesting from this court. So I find in your favor and against Mr. Brooks in the amount of $1,020,000, and that is my final verdict. This matter is adjourned. Our attorneys across America just viewed this case for the first time. Let's hear what Hoyt Tessner has to say. In every trial, the plaintiff must explain and, if possible, demonstrate exactly what happened to cause injury. Expert testimony and the video show just how powerful and dangerous a nail gun can be and demonstrate the extent and severity of Ms. McGuire's injury. This case shows how important it is to use power tools safely. Safety should always come first, especially around construction. is Personal Injury Court. Good day, everyone. This is the matter of Newman versus Levy. Miss Newman, it's my understanding that you're suing Mr. Levy for injuries to your ear that you sustained while renting an apartment from Mr. Levy. You're asking this court to award you $15,000 for your medical expenses and $175,000 for pain and suffering for a total award of $190,000. Is that correct? Yes, Your Honor. And Mr. Levy, you believe this is not your fault because you did everything you were supposed to do and you should not be held responsible for her injuries. Is that true? Yes, Your Honor. Well, let's get into the legal sauce. Now, how did you come to rent this apartment? So, I've been living there two years. And okay. the first year, uh, I'll be honest, it was really wonderful. It's a great neighborhood. I love my neighbors and it's walking distance to the school. I'm a kindergarten teacher and I can ride my bike there. It saves me gas money. And as somebody on a really tight budget, that's incredibly important. I mean, rent is affordable, so, so... up until this day, you're pretty happy with your apartment? Yes, Your Honor. So, Mr. Levy, was she a pretty good tenant? She was, but she wasn't very communicative. Um, I've owned this apartment now for about 10 years. In fact, I helped build it. I have another one that's about 30 years old. And I'll tell you, I provide my tenants with a good living experience. I provide them security through contracts. I provide them a beautiful landscape. And I provide them press control. Is this on... your spot here? That's correct. It looks like a nice place. Indeed it is. And we get excellent ratings on all of the internet sites. I'm very proud to be the landlord there. So, Ms. Newman, you, you're having a good time being at this apartment up until this day. What happened? So, I started noticing cockroaches here and there. And at first it was just one or two, and then they multiplied. I mean, they were everywhere. Like, it was disgusting. And I'm sorry, I'm sorry if I'm super loud, but my hearing is a little gone. This is a video you submitted to the court. You shot this on your phone? I did, yes, yes, And, and this is in your apartment? That's in my apartment. And that's just in the frame of, that's just in, like, this little tiny area of my apartment, too. Mr. Levy, I, I thought for a moment that Miss Newman was uh, mistaken. Maybe these are those palmetto bugs that people try to tell me aren't roaches. Those are roaches. Indeed, they are. We've never had any complaints from any other tenants about roaches in our property. Well, how did you get hurt? The morning that it happened, I had been swimming. I like to swim in the mornings. And I went to school, worked all day. I was exhausted. And I went home to get my necessities papers, and I was so tired, I fell asleep on my couch. OK. And when I woke up, I felt something in my ear. and. <laughs> I'll be honest, at first, I thought it was just water trapped on my ear canal. It's not uncommon to have water trapped in your ear canal for 24 to 48 hours after you go swimming. Yes, ma'am. I've been swimming for a long time, so I knew that. And then 
48 hours later, I realized this was not, <laughs> this was not just water. There was a cockroach in my ear canal and I could feel every leg. I could feel every antenna. I could feel everything. It was literally inside my head, making its home what in my ear canal, burning its way inside my How head. How did you know that there was a cockroach in your ear? Because I could, I could feel its little legs. You can feel it. You can feel it stuck in your, and forgive me for, you can feel it stuck in your earwax. It's really gross. And I had but to go, I had to go, I'm not done, to, I'm not finished. For her I to had to there. go to the ER and they put a video in my ear. You submitted that ear. video to yes, the court. Yes, sir, I did. Yes, your honor. Let's take a look at it. Uh, they're looking in your ear. All right. Okay. Okay. Let me get this clear. So you had a cockroach in your ear? In my ear, and it would have gone further if I hadn't taken action when I, when I knew that it was a bug in my ear. So that's what was crawling around? You felt the legs and things? I couldn't. You could see the little hairs on the legs, too, and I could feel them sticking sticking to the wax in my ear. <laughs> it was Cockroaches disgusting. do something to me. Okay, so. It was like a horror movie. <sighs> So uh, they, they pulled it out of your ear? They, they did, Your Honor, and it was very, very delicate surgery. And they told me that now I have a perforated eardrum, which is a hole in my ear because this man didn't do anything about it. Now, Mr. Levy, did you exterminate this place on a regular basis? Yes, we did, Your Honor. In fact, as required in the lease, we re, uh, exterminated every six months by having an outside contractor come in and do it professionally. And I have copies of the reports for well, you. All right, Sheriff Matt, will you retrieve those reports from Mr. Lee? And also the invoices. Well, I'm looking at your invoice number 36571. It's billed to you and it's dated February 22nd. That's correct. It says treatment, target pest, full service. And then it says Mark Levy. Is that your signature there? Uh, yes, it is. So you had a professional exterminator in August. Absolutely. Can I just say something? Yes. It had been, it had actually been eight months since an exterminator had been to the building. And in my contract, every six months, one is supposed to come out. So he had ample time to find another one. Well, Honestly, I think he was being, so he was late. being a cheapskate. Yes, sir. He Indeed, was he was Your Honor, late. we were informed by our contractor that he was going to cancel the contract. It took me a while to find somebody else. But as soon as I got notice that there was a roach infestation. You were on it. I was on it, and I took care of it myself. The fact is, I, it had been eight months, and my contract is supposed to be every six months an exterminator comes out. And I emailed him, I called him, I texted him, I sent him the picture that you saw of all those roaches, and I got no response. You emailed until, and texted him? I did, oh. and I got nothing until I sent I, him a formal complaint letter. But honestly, I don't think I should have even had to do that if it had been eight months. He should have had ample time to find someone else to prevent this from even happening. I have the messages with me if you'd like to see them, Your Honor. You brought them with you. Sheriff yes, Matt, if you get the messages. Thank you, sir. You're the best. <laughs> All right. There's a uh, text message here, June 22nd. She alleges she sent them. It says, Mr. Levy, I have nasty bugs in my apartment. When's the exterminator coming? <laughs> well, There's no evidence that anything was sent or even that I received it. Mr. Levy, then there's a second one, June 24th, that's in caps, which means they're screaming at you. Mr. Levy, I haven't heard from you. It's nasty. And then finally, there's a picture of the roaches attached. She's screaming for your attention. Your Honor, note that there's still no address on and the text message. And note that there's still Did no you get these text either. messages? I never got the text still messages. Still no response. The first notice I got was the letter that she sent me. Once I got that letter, that triggered my entrance into her apartment. I went to the hardware store, I bought some um, roach killer. I went up to that apartment myself in order to see what was going on. And I have to tell you, it was appalling in that apartment. Ooh. No matter how many chemicals you put around, it's not going to account for the dirty clothes that are piled up and for the dirty dishes that are around. Now, Let's you took some that. pictures. It looks, exactly. It I'm looks a teacher. to me like I have an to be organized and orderly. to that's, a roach. Ms. Newman, is this apartment. your apartment? 
Yes, Your Honor, it is my apartment, but I hers. will I will pref I will tell you that when this first started happening, I wanted to see if I could find where the roaches were coming from myself. So I did oh. take apart a few things, but when I realized they were everywhere, I, I honestly couldn't even move around without touching them. So I had to take what few things I could and get out. Was it nasty, Mr. Levy? It was nasty. And she has an agreement with us that she's supposed to keep the place clean to avoid roaches. Had you gotten these text messages, would you have come early? Absolutely. So you blame her. I do. No other adjoining apartments reported this. Only her apartment. So you didn't have any complaints from any other residents Absolutely about not. roaches? Absolutely not. Now, Ms. Newman, uh, if the roaches are focused on your place, isn't there a reason for that? Huh? Honestly, Your Honor, I don't believe so. I'm not the kind of person I don't leave open containers with which to attract roaches oh. with. And understand this, a lease is two ways. You have responsibilities, but you have responsibilities also. You gotta keep your place clean. Uh, Did you understand I, that? Can you say that again? I can oh. say it louder. Turn oh. your head this way. Oh, what, you, please. You must keep your place clean because the lease requires it. It didn't seem like you did. So, uh, Your Honor, this is a one-time thing for me. I maintain my life very well. I'm a teacher. I have to organize them. Uh, oh, you please. can go to the school Roaches yourself. love teachers, too. You can go I to the I mean, this come on. You, this I'm a very is person. not how an adult lives. It's none of your lives. business how I maintain it my life. Order in this court. Ms. Newman, I know this is heavy for you. You're asking this court to give you $15,000 for your past medicals. Yes, Your Honor. You mentioned that the ER doc took this roach out of your ear. This court has consulted Dr. Neelam Vaughn. She's an ER doc who's done this many times. She's going to tell us about how you do this and what's the impact. So, Sheriff Matt, will you get Dr. Vaughn? Yes, Your Honor. Hello, Dr. Vaughn. Hello. This is kind of everybody's nightmare. How does this happen? How do you get a cockroach in your ear? It's not really that uncommon. Bugs, we get complaints of this three to four times a month. Sometimes three to more. four times a month? Sometimes more. Um, there's different bugs that can end up in there. Spiders that make webs. But in this case, of course, we're talking about a cockroach. And cockroaches love a warm, moist environment. And so the bug travels in, latches its legs in, and kind of cozies in your eardrum. And, and do they die there? Do they lay eggs? What do they do? All of the above. And most of the time, they'll stay alive. And that's, you know, obviously really creepy. So, so the ER doc took this uh, picture. How do you get that thing out of there? Well, you usually put some viscous lidocaine or mineral oil or something to, with the hopes that it dies and kind of float it. And then you go in with alligator forceps and you carefully try to grab it. They did that. And they're able to hopefully take it out well, he's not wanting to go out. He likes his home. And they're able to take it out. And it looks pretty successful here. You have found whole roaches in people's ears? I have. It's really not that uncommon. So. Ms. Newman says she's suffering some hearing loss. What kind of damage does a bug like this do to someone's ear? Well, it depends. It can have some permanent hearing loss, or sometimes it can, you can get your hearing back. Well, what, what part of the ear is damaged? Well, you have the outer ear, your ear canal, where, you know, it's the middle ear, and then you have your eardrum, that's that round area right there, and then the bones of your ear, and then the cochlea, which is kind of your hearing organ. Okay. So sound comes in from the outside, through the middle ear, to the eardrum, and if it's perforated, aka if there's a hole in it, you can't really get the sound through effectively. So would the bug put a, a hole in your eardrum? It can. It can make a little hole, or it can kind of completely obliterate it. No. Does that eardrum heal? It's variable. You know, sometimes with, we hope that it heals, but it's not uncommon for it to not heal either. If it doesn't heal, what happens to your hearing ability? It's diminished. And Permanently? It can be. It's possible. Thank you, doctor. Thank you. You are released. Thank you. So, Ms. Newman, yes, sir. you've submitted $15,000 in medical bills to this court. Having to pay that, what's that done to you? I feel so stressed out all the time. I go to school and I know I, I mean, I know I have, I'm gonna have to take on extra classes now. I'm gonna have to substitute a lot more. I'm gonna have to tutor on the weekends. But the fact is the kids think I'm a freak. I teach kindergarten. You have to wear that to class? I do, I have to wear this all the time. I can't hear kids in the back of the classroom. I'm a kindergarten teacher. It was, it was already hard Did to deal with them never when I never had this. And now I, home I sanitation it's affected courses? my entire ability. I mean, it's don't you get my the idea that ability roaches to with Love my student. Robert. Mr. Levy, direct your comments to me. I can't hear if you're talking to him. 
So, Ms. Newman, how are you able to afford this on a teacher's salary? Well, the fact is I can't. I am working, I mean, I'm working twice as many hours as I used to. I don't have my weekends, I don't have time off. I, I can't see my family because of how much I'm working. And on top of that, I mean, we're talking about I'm more susceptible to ear infections. I may never be able to swim again. I mean, I may, be, I may have tinnitus for the rest of my life, which is like really intense ear ringing. I don't even know if a hearing aid is gonna be an option for me. And if so, how much is that gonna cost? I don't have my peripheral vision right now, so I'm having to sort of do this right here. And the kids think they think I'm crazy. I mean, I feel like a, some sort of monster around them. And I hate that. I love kids. That's all I ever wanted to do. Folks, I think I've heard enough. I'm ready to render my decision. In every personal injury case, the plaintiff, you, Ms. Newman, you have to prove three things. You've got to prove that Mr. Levy was wrong, that he did something wrong, and that his wrong act caused your injuries. You've shown this court today that this was a, almost a perfect place until the roaches came, that he ignored your complaints, and then he tried to do a quick fix. You ended up having a roach go in your ear and affect your hearing in a permanent way. Mr. Levy, you believe that the roaches came because she invited them from being so nasty in her apartment and that this is her fault. Plus, you went on your own to try to address the problem. For an owner to be responsible in a premises liability case, you have to have notice of a problem, you sent the text messages, and then you must address it reasonably. The law does not require an owner to ensure your safety. The law requires an owner to act reasonably. Here, the problem for me is that you had a professional exterminator before this, and this time, you tried to do it yourself. So, Ms. Newman, I believe that you have proven that Mr. Levy is wrong and that his wrong caused your hearing loss and injury. In that regard, I find in your favor and will award you $15,000 for your past medicals and $175,000 for your pain and suffering for a total award of $190,000. I find in your favor, that's my final award, and this matter is adjourned. Our attorneys across America just viewed this case for the first time. Let's hear what Hoyt Tessner has to say. If you're renting, the terms of the lease dictate responsibilities of you and the landlord, including how to notify your landlord of any problems. Does the lease require written notice via certified mail to a certain address? Then a text is not good enough, and you definitely don't want to end up with roaches in your ear because of improper notice.